Today is Father's Day, as you all know, and a great opportunity to speak about fatherhood. One judge, one judge who dealt with many family conflicts and issues over the years, a judge in the court have seen many, many number, number of families, broken families. He came to an interesting conclusion. This is what he said. We adults spend far too much time preparing the path for our youth and far little time preparing our youth for the path. Let me repeat. This is profound. We as adults spend far too much time preparing the path for our youth and far too little time preparing our youth for the path. Think about it. It is true, indeed, that it's much easier in our time to make sure that children have good education, good food, good clothes, education, entertainment, food, cars, you name it. But it's far more challenging to have real spiritual formation of the character of your children. Today's text, and we'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, please find your way there. This chapter provides us with best, I would say, picture of real spiritual fatherhood in action. Interesting, spiritual fatherhood in action. This is something definitely is lacking in a society that we live in, even in the churches. So as we study this chapter, I want you to see with me four ways spiritual fatherhood influences children. Now, this chapter is written actually about pastors shepherding and influencing the church. And so I want to imply, apply it also to us pastors, four ways spiritual fatherhood influences the church, how leaders at church also have influence on people. So four ways fathers can be spiritual leaders, influencers at home. Okay. Uh, I know usually I read the passage and then we study. If I read the passage, uh, all of it, that's going to be 20 verses. So I want to read one verse that I think is like a nail right in the middle of this chapter that everything hangs on. And that would be verse 8. And I recommend do something extra radical right now is for you to underline that verse. I know, I know. It's going to be a struggle. Maybe it will take the next 30 minutes to win over your conscience and underline it. But I strongly recommend it. Actually, I did this morning. You see? I, I highlighted this verse. So you're not alone. Okay? Verse 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. Because you had become very dear to us. Amazing. We're going to get to that verse. We're going to look at many verses in this chapter. But for the time's sake, let's just begin walking through this chapter. In four ways. Spiritual fatherhood is expressed in the context of church or the family. Number one, influence in the midst of problems. Influence in the midst of problems. Look at verse one, look at verse two. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but Though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Much conflict, suffered, shamefully treated. Now, let's stop and use our imagination. Imagine what would great, real, best spiritual fatherhood look like in real life. 
I was this week sitting down and I imagine. Now, follow along. Father comes home. Children approach him. Line up in line with notebooks and pen, pens. Dad, would you share your wisdom with us? He says, yes, children, sit down. They sit down right next to his feet. He sits in a nice chair. A wife brings a cup of coffee for him, of course. He grabs a coffee, and he begins for next three hours share his insights into life and wisdom, deep knowledge of things, and, and children just writing and, and, and clarifying questions. Dad, what did you mean this? Uh, could you repeat, please? And they would, they would just soak everything in and for three hours, quietness. Everything is so smooth, and children are just into it for three hours. As, so, as, uh, as the session is over, and Father, you dismiss your children to go in their rooms and memorize what they've learned, your wife brings another cup of coffee and does you a neck massage, and you just kind of prepare for a next step in your spiritual fatherhood. Is that something uh, you guys go through, right? I mean, in our family, uh, we, we slightly uh, modification. We do four hours of that kind of study. Of course, you're, you're laughing because I'm probably pushing it slightly, right? Uh, in reality, I mean, uh, the, that, that l little phrase, in the midst of quiet, t quietness, that already kind of probably made you suspicious. This is not real life situation. Real life situation is absolutely different. It's so different. I mean, maybe you get the coffee. Uh, uh, but a lot of fathers on, father, uh, on Father's Day come to church and they hear the message, what they ought to be like. And they realize, okay, this is, this, this is the image that preacher described and here's where the reality, where I am. And they say, well, all this three hours sitting and just, you know, sharing wisdom and, and, and this is your spiritual. This is not me. So, and a lot of fathers get discouraged. They get discouraged. And some even want to leave. So if you're thinking like that, uh, a first time, uh, I, a first service, I said, ushers, please lock the gates because some, some, some fathers will be tempted. Uh, to go and ushers rushed. No, no, just kidding. They didn't. They, they know that sometimes I'm, I joke. But uh, listen, fathers who have been discouraged maybe up to this point throughout your life on Father's Day, today's number one point is actually for you. Because it's what sounds influence in the midst of problems. Oh, that's more like me. That's more like me. Look at the problems. I mean, we, men we mentioned... Verse 2, already suffered, shamefully treated, in the midst of much conflict. Is this over? No, 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 it's not over yet. Look at verse 14. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that, in Judea, that are in Judea. For you suffered, you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out, drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles. I mean, the opposition, the conflicts, the problems were all over. All over. They were inside. They were outside. They were everywhere. So if you're... A parent, if you're a father, and say, my life is pretty beat up. I'm, a, I'm a with bruises today. Paul says, I came to Thessalonica in bruises. So we can talk. I understand your problems. More than that, let me tell you something more. The recipients of this letter were also in bruises. So kids are messed up too. Not only your life is messed up, your kid's life. And so there's so much conflict. There's so many challenges. And it's so interesting. This chapter says that in the midst of these challenges, parenting takes place. This is so great. That's encouraging already because I thought I need to 
clean out my life, and then I'm going to sit down, get my coffee, get my three hours, and I'm going to start teaching my children. Paul, okay, we see your bruises. You see your beat up. We see Thessalonians, they're beat up. How did you, in the midst of all these challenges and troubles, still were able to impact them, to have influence, show that spiritual fatherhood? How in the world? Thank you for asking good questions. Look at verse 2. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. So, in order to push through all these hardships in life, outside, you know, there's so many inside also. And parenting must ha take place. How do you get through all of this? By that simple word, boldness. Boldness means you are confident. How do you get that? Pastor, help me. Well, I look at the passage. Because verse 3 begins with what? We had boldness. Verse 3, 4. 4, it's because. In other words, he describes in the following verses, how do you get the boldness that in the midst of conflict and challenging life situation, you can still be spiritual father to your children. How do you do that? How do you get that boldness? Well, he begins with number one, boldness in doctrinal purity. Because verse three deals with teaching. For our appeal, our teaching, our speech does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. In other words, he says, listen, I am confident. I have boldness. I not overcome all challenges because my teaching, what I bring is not my preferences, is not what I think in my opinions. I bring objective truth and it's pure and I check that and God is my witness. Number one, boldness comes not when you just, with your authority, push through at home, but when you operate with the truth, with objective truth. Number two, boldness. Oh, this is, this is gonna hurt some. Boldness in freedom from man pleasing. Mm. Look at verse four, verse five. But just as we have been up, approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men. We're not men pleasers, but to please God who tests our hearts. And he continue, continues, for we never came with words of flattery, as you know. When do we flatter someone? When we try to please people with speech? What do we do? If, if you run into someone who is flattering you, who's just really sweet to you. What are they trying to do? They do it not for you. Don't be mistaken. No, 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 no. They're not doing it for you. They're doing it for themselves. They want to be liked. They want to be received. So when people flatter, they want to actually manipulate you into doing something. Temptation in parenting is always to be likable rather than be, being helpful. Temptation in parenting is always to be likable by children and not be helpful. This is why fathers don't discipline their children. This is why fathers spoil their children. This is why fathers don't speak about problems in the lives of their children as they grow up. No, 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 no. I will be a nice father. I'll give them the candies. I'll give them the car. I'll give them what they want. I want discipline. I want talk. I am a nice guy. Zero spiritual fatherhood. Zero. Failed. Why? Because they want to manipulate children into liking themselves. Selfish father. No spiritual fatherhood. When you deal with that, 
and you're free from liking of your children, but you want to help them over time when they grow up fearing God and respecting people and loving people, they will say, fathers, thank you so much that you disciplined, that you didn't spoil me, that you worked for me and you addressed issues in my, and you spoke to my heart. Thank you so much. It was not pleasant at that moment, but it produced much fruit. Be free. Be bold. Be free from man-pleasing. Number three, boldness in freedom from the love of money. How come? Where? Money. Who dropped the money? Look at verse 5. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Big thing. Oh, yes, big thing. In, he's talking about pastors, pastors, greedy pastors. No go. Church will die. Spiritually, oh, it might grow in size wise, yeah. But spiritually, deadness. At home, if father loves money, no spiritual influence, no spiritual fatherhood. It can be expressed in, in many ways. A father being greedy and not sharing resources with kids, being he just overly materialistic, materialistic, everything is about money. I don't want to spend time with you because it's going to cost $5 because I will need to buy you ice cream. Why do that? Are you serving your family or your personal agenda? I'm not talking about you stop earning money. No, no. You need to earn and you need to earn more, maybe more. That's not the idea. But do you love money? Because if you love money, it will come across ugly in relationship to your children. You're going to be stingy or you're going to be materialistic in everything that you do at home. And kids are going to, what about me, dad? No, 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 no. Now, as you're listening to all of this, you're, you're maybe thinking, okay, you mentioned some of the outer problems, conflicts outside, problems with people in Thessalonica. They were also beat up. You're beat up, they're beat up, and in the midst of it, you have inner struggles that you just list, uh, listed, and you're thinking, I, 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 I am there, at least in some points. So what should you do? The context of this chapter says that in the midst of all of these struggles, Paul is influencing. You don't need to wait until you clean up your life. And you just overcome everything, resolve everything, solve everything, fix everything. And then you sit down and say, kids, would you come now? I will teach you. They say, dad, too late. I'm 50 already. You should have done that 40 years ago. Don't wait until you're 80 to do that. Begin when you're 20. Number two. The way spiritual fatherhood is expressed. Not only we influence in the midst of problems, in the midst of problems. That's when parenting happens because children see that father is lacking in money, lacking in time, lacking in his own character and struggling, but he pours his life, shares everything he has with them. They see the struggle and say, Dad, I respect you. I know it's hard for you. I know you're limited with time, with resources, but you give. Oh, in the midst of struggles and being beat up and bruises, you crawling at home and they respect that. And spiritual fatherhood happens. Besides that, number two, influence in word and deed. In word and Indeed, this is where we get to verse 8. Did you catch that? Verse 2 presents two awesome instruments in the hands of every spiritual father. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, number one, teaching, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. Two things, equally important factors of influence at home 
are teaching and the very life of the teacher. You cannot just share your instruction and keep your life to yourself, private. It's impossible. If you want to influence, you begin with teaching, then throw in even your life. Explain. Help us see this. Okay. Number one. First is transmission of the truth. Passing on of the truth. Let me tell you one thing. Children need to hear the objective truth. Children need to hear from you the objective truth. Especially in the world we're living in where it's so subjective. It's so much, so many opinions. They need to have some kind of solid ground. And if you don't fight it with the truth and just with another opinion that you impose on them, you're going to lose your children. So you don't teach your children your preferences, your traditions, your opinions, your suggestions, because the world is full of that, and they're going to rub, they're going to bring you stronger arguments. You bring something objective, something more powerful, something more authoritative than you. This is the same thing that the people in church need objective reality, objective truth preached, not another opinion that I come and share, well, this is my opinion, who cares? We need to bring the word of God Verse 13, look at that, beautiful. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, yes, we were the ones teaching you, you accepted it not as the word of man, but as what it is, what is, what really is the word of God, which is at work in you believers. This is the change that happens with the person who believes. Suddenly, he receives this not as another opinion in the world of opinions. He receives this as the word of God. Something unique. He says, something unique. I've read a number of books. I've been to many meetings. But when I come here, I hear objective truth. Wow. Do your children experience that at home? This is where your authority is rooted. This is where your influence begins. We must do everything possible to make sure that children are exposed to the truth. Because the world is going to sell so much corruption. I don't want to list even things. You know what month we're celebrating and on and on. We don't celebrate, I mean, the world. But that's not the only tool you're Ability to read the Bible, bring children to the place where it's read, it taught, it preached. But also, you need to include yourself in the process. And it's interesting that if the first process is not on, the second is not possible. People, children don't need just you fishing with them every day. That's not going to do much to them. Yes, it might attach a little string between you and your children. But they need more than that. They need instruction. You've done it. And only then you can do the second. Influence is to invite someone into your life. Let me repeat. Influence is to invite someone into your life. This is what the second part deals with. He says, we're not only entrusted you with the gospel of God, verse 8, but also our own selves. They have given themselves. They opened up to others. They invited others into their lives. How do you, how do, you do that? You're asking probably the question, hey, I want to invite my children. I want to share myself. I want to give myself. How do I do this? What do I do? Help, give me steps. Thank you. I like your practical thinking. Let's begin with this. You talk about your weakness. How about that? It's an easy one, right? Kids, I have struggles. I have sins. I'm struggling with this. Um, challenges in my life. Here are the challenges. Here are my worries. Here are my temptations. You take it. Look at verse 4, 5, 6. We mentioned that temptations like man-pleasing, fear of man, like greed, 
Or verse 6, nor did we seek glory from people, seeking glory to yourself. All kinds of things. Do your children know your weaknesses? And you confess and you say, you know what? I'm not perfect. Or you try to present your Pharisaic perfect image. And you're going to fail one day. Actually, children inside already laughing at your perfect image that you try to present. No, we need to be real and we need to even be able to share our weaknesses. Look at verse, uh, look at chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Paul has done it a number of times throughout the New Testament, shared his, exposed himself to some degree and he, he shared that he was weak. He was not afraid to admit that. Look at verse 1, 2, and 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we begin. And I, speaking of Paul, when I came to you now in Corinth, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech and wisdom. You're like, oh, that's me. Because when you mentioned teaching your children, I'm, I'm not really good at teaching. That's okay. Paul is in the same boat. He says, I'm no lofty speech for sure. No wisdom sharing for three hours. Verse 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Very simple message. Verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. What? I'm not going to listen to this kind of guy. He's in fear and weakness and much trembling. What kind of authority? I'm not going to listen to this guy. Like, oh, no, that's not about me. Actually, he won that church. First Corinthian, Corinthian church was very harsh, very hard church. And he won them over. Not with strong, but with weakness. Amazing. You think you're going to win your children by force? Oh no, you're going to fail. Share your weakness. Talk about your weaknesses. Do you talk about your heart with your children? Number two, verse eight, talks about us talking about our feelings. Father's like, feelings? Me? No, no, no. That's my wife's specialty. Uh, I, uh, you know, what, what are you talking about? Feelings. Well, look at verse 8. I mean, man speaking. So, being affectionately desires of you. Affections? Man, what are you talking about? Look at the end of verse 8. Because you had become very dear to us. Yes, yes. It's okay if you tell your wife, I love you. It's okay if you say to your children, I love you, kids. It's okay if you express your feelings and you talk about your affections. Look at verse 17. But since we were torn up away from you, brothers... For a short time in person, not in heart. We, in heart? You're talking about the heart, Paul. We endeavored the more eagerly with a great desire to see your face to face. Because you, we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it that, is it? Not you. So he's talking about his feelings for these people, for the church. And so occasionally I use the opportunity to say, I love our church. I like that we can talk about it with, with, with pastors. Once in a while I just text them, the pastoral team. Say, I love you guys. Crickets. And then a couple guys reply. But it's great. Do you, do you, do you say that to your wife? I love you, crickets. Weird guy. I don't like that. What he wants from me. He just loves you. Express. Don't, don't. This is a tool God wants you to put to use to reach your kids. If you're just being lecturing for three hours, I'm sorry. You need to hug them. Sit with them for three hours sometimes. And just talk about your feelings. Can you do that for three hours? 
challenge this week. Moreover, lastly, you risk and sacrifice for your children. You risk and sacrifice. Look at verse 2 again. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, so a neighboring city, they had been mistreated, they were suffering there. As you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you in Thessalonica. And my question as I study, I always ask, what made them think that what they received in that city would not receive in this? Oh, yes, was, you, can, you can count the same treatment they would receive here. And yet, they risked for this people. They, they got bruised there. They come for a set of bruises here, but they want to bless people. They, wanna, they care for the church. They love the people. They want to risk their own lives. They want to sacrifice for, you know, parents, fathers. When was the last time you risked something for the sake of your children? When was the last time you really sacrificed yourself for the good of your family? Influence happens in the word, what you say, objective truth, and also indeed you Invite your children in your life by talking about your weakness, your feelings, and even taking risks. Number three, a third way we influence at home as fathers, as spiritual fathers, influence by changed character. Changed character. God wants you to work on your own character. And that becomes an instrument to influence your children. Verse so I can, I can say it this way. The character or a character changed by Christ becomes a very powerful tool in parenting and influencing children or chil influencing at home or at church, as a matter of fact. If I'm not being transformed, my teaching will be in vain. You're like, this guy, what he's saying and what he leaves is so separate. I, this, this, I'm done with this. Same thing at home. Look at verse 7. How the gospel changed Paul. Amazing. You will love this. <laughs> Look at verse 7. I was, I was studying. This is a man writing. Guys, this is a man writing. Look at verse 7. But we, Paul speaking about him, Silas and Timothy, three guys, three men. But we were gentle among you. What? You kidding me? I'm going back to my garage. This is, this is getting creepy. We were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. What? You push this too far. You're thinking that you're nursing mother. This is how, what gospel does to man. This is what the gospel does to man. When the gospel comes, they become gentle. They become caring, tender, attentive. Now, is your character under influence of the gospel? Amazing. Verse 8. Affectionately desirous of you. In other words, they're, they're emotionally attached to these people. When the gospel when the gospel advances in someone's life, feelings for other people flourish. Think about it. When the gospel advances in your life, feelings and affections for other people flourish. This is what's happening. He's under influence of the gospel and he becomes a nursing mother. He is affectionately desirous of people in church. He loves them. Look at verse 9. When the gospel works on and Paul, what he does in verse 9 is amazing. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. In other words, he had a side business. He was working outside of the church. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So he is using an argument of his freedom, liberty, to, to receive support from the church. He teaches about it later in other passages, in other 
books. He's teaching that those who work, they, they are okay to receive support. And he knows that. And he has this right and freedom to do that. And he says, I'm not going to do it for your sake. Willingness to give up his freedom, even his certain rights for the sake of others. That's affection. He worked hard. Verse 10, he was also fighting for his inner purity. You call it holiness. Verse 10, you are witnesses and God also. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. In other words, he worked on his own heart first. And that was effective in reaching people. Fathers, this is uncomfortable. It might hurt. Fathers, if you do not change over years, your bad habits don't disappear. Sins hang over you for years, do not leave you. How will you tell your children that the word of God will change them? <laughs> if it's not changing you, you kids need to listen because it will change your life. Dad, come on, you're hanging over this stuff for years. So, a very hard question. If you're not changing, you need to be born again. But if there is at least a small progress, if there is a small change over years, you look a year ago and now, and there is a couple steps you've taken. Praise God, that already gives hope to your children. Of course, to you as well. Fourth, fourth way we influence our children, spiritual fatherhood is expressed by influence, by consistency. Influence by consistency. Two reasons I think this chapter is teaching this. I see this, and I hope you will see this as well. Consistency is the key, because some of you might be really hyped up right after this message. That was such a good message. I'm going to apply it. I'm gonna, we're going to have a three-hour session to tonight with coffee. Good luck. Uh, first thing is you're going to give up tomorrow morning. So the, 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 you need to have a strategy that it works for days and years, weeks, months, and years. Spiritual influence, fatherhood, is not one day event it's a lifelong event two reasons i see in this chapter number one from verse one all the way to verse 11 for six times he uses interesting phrase as you know you know you know you know some of you have this parasite phrase you know you know you're praying, and I've heard you pray, some of you, and you're speaking to God. You know God. You know God. You know. He's like, stop. I know it. So the parasite. Th this is not the, 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 the parasite, okay? But it's close to that, right? Six times in, verse, in 11 verses. I mean, this is, look at verse 1. For you yourselves know, brothers. Look at verse 2. As you know, we had boldness in our God. Hmm. Verse 5, for we never came with words of flattery, as you know. Verse 9, for you remember, brothers. Verse 10, you are witnesses and God also. Verse 11, for you know how, like a father with his children. Six times, different wording, but the idea is that you know, you remember, you're witnesses, you've seen it, you know it. So in other words, he's not saying something that... It was new to them. Actually, the whole chapter 2 of Thessalonians is nothing new for that church. They're like, oh, yeah, we know that. Oh, we, we know that. We know that. We know that. We know that. Thank you. Not an interesting sermon. Chapter 2 was not interesting for them. It was boring because they knew it. And so like, hey, I'm going to, another point, you know it. Another point, you know it. Like, is this all? Yeah, chapter 2 is over. Sermon is over. You know it all. In other words, they were witnesses. It was a consistent life throughout. 
Number two reason, not only the past, because he's operating, you know our past, you know how we conducted ourselves in front of you for years, but also he present, presents the now, and even kind of looking into future, look at verse 17, but since we were torn apart, away from you brothers for a short time in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, and again and, and again, but Satan hindered us for, for what is, is, what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you, for you are our glory and joy. He brings even the present, the now. So influence, listen, influence is not one, some flashy moment in your parenting. As I mentioned a couple months ago, that no kids uh, were affected, at least that I know of, by one key phrase that their father a long time ago said, just one phrase, and it landed on them and changed their life radically. Most likely, there are no people like that. Majority of you were influenced by your parents, not by phrase they said once, but a life they lived in front of you. They were hardworking, they were faithful, they were loving, and that was proved over years. 20, 30 years, and you say, that affected me the most. Not one key phrase they said. So a lot of you are thinking, give me the key. I'm going to come home, and I'm going to say that phrase, and a mystery will happen. No. you got to work hard for next 20, 30 years. That's what it is. He says, we were, and you know, and we are, and you know. Why do we study this passage on Father's Day? As we conclude, I have three reasons. Three reasons why we did study this passage today. Number one, to encourage fathers towards spiritual fatherhood. To encourage fathers towards spiritual influence at home, to influence their children. Plus, you didn't catch that, but we created an accountability. Both wives and children now know what to expect from you. You guys are cut. We captured you. Now you will have natural accountability at home, fathers. Now it's too late to run already. You had an opportunity during first point. But that's not the main point. The main point why I want to encourage dads fathers towards spiritual fatherhood because here's the scenario i know we need to be realistic you take all of this and you try hard to apply lord willing by god's grace you will what if what if some children still at the end of the day hearing seeing all of that in you make the wrong choice and mess up their lives what if that, that's, that's very possible. I mean, even speaking of 12 disciples of Jesus, one decided, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So there are chances. What do you do? And I know parents who had done their best and their children decided to not make wise, wise choices in life. What gives you encouragement? There is encouragement in this passage. Look at verse 1. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. So there was effective spiritual fatherhood. How do you measure that? And he gives it away, how you measure that. From verses 12 all the way to 12, I mean, from verse 2 to 12, 2 to 12, he never mentions what effect it produced in people. He lists all the responsibilities he was fulfilling. In other words, what he has done. Your success is measured mainly 
by your faithful fulfillment of your role and not by the result it produces. Because the result is God's work and not your. Your is faithfully fulfill your role. Look at verse 2 all the way to 12. This is comforting and encouraging for you. Man, you should continue even if not everything is turning the, the, the way you, you want it. That's okay. You need to be faithful. You need to do verses one, two, two, two through 12. That is encouragement for you, brother, brothers. Number two, why we study this to encourage mothers and children, specifically mothers and children, in situations where the father does not fulfill this role. When the father is either absent completely, there's no father at home, or the father is not a spiritual leader at home. This passage is an encouragement for you. You say, how? How? Well, here's the thing. This chapter was written to the church. This chapter about spiritual fatherhood was written to the church. And so if you don't receive it at home, you can take your children and you children come to church where mature Godly man will influence your children. Bring them to church. Make everything possible. Plug them in ministry. Plug them in small groups. Bring them to church. Bring them so that they interact with mature, godly men. So if it doesn't happen at home, this passage gives you hope because it is about church. So if it doesn't happen at home, the church steps in. Number three. We study this passage for the gospel's sake. You say, what are you talking about? Well, what about the scenario where you don't receive it at home and you come to church and for various reasons, you come 15 minutes later and you leave 15 minutes before the service is over and you don't receive spiritual fatherhood at, at church. What if that happens as well? This passage is also for you. Because God wants to step in and be your spiritual father. Look at verse 2. We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God. Look at verse 8. We were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God. Look at verse 9. While we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Verse 13 and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, the gospel, Greek word euangelion, literally means the good news. What is the good news? Look at verse 16. By hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. The good news is salvation. Salvation, saved, saved from what? I'm not drowning. What are you going to save me from? Verse 16, keep on reading. So, as always, to fill up the measure of their sins, but God's wrath has come upon them at last. The coming wrath of God. To be saved from the judgment that is approaching after death is judgment. And so those who are not saved, those who have not received the fatherhood, who are not adopted into God's family, do not receive the gospel of God, they will be facing God's wrath. This is it. And so this is why he would preach Christ. He says, Christ died in your place, took the wrath of God on himself, that he had to pour on you, but he received it, absorbed it all in your place, would you just believe and confess your sins and receive that salvation free? God says, what you would say, why would he do this? So that God is glorified. God is glorified. He's the most merciful person in the universe. We don't deserve it. We fight it. Look at verse 15. Who killed, so they were opposing to the preaching of God, God's gospel, 
the gospel of God. They were so opposing that they killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. But so interesting. When that opposition happens, God takes that and uses actually for their benefit because Jesus died for their sins. So if you are experiencing in your parenting at home opposition, God can take that and use it into a benefit. And only God can do this. You won't be able. So if some of you are thinking, okay, gospel of God sounds very interesting. What do I do? Verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this. That when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Received is not the same as agreed with. Because a lot of people think, I come to church and I agree with what was taught. They received. It's a different one. Receiving is not agreeing. Receiving means you submit. Receiving, you submit, you act upon it, you become obedient to it. How do you know? Well, verse 14 well, verse even 13 says that you accepted it not as the word of man, but as what it is, what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. It begins to work in you. What it means that the word says, love your enemy. And I don't just read, it says, love your enemy. Great stuff. I agree with that. No, no, no. Love your enemy and I go and I love my enemy. The Bible says, love your wife. It actually does in Ephesians 5. And then I say, oh, I agree. That's such a good stuff. No, I act upon it. I love my wife. That's what it means to receive the word. Did you receive the word? In other words, does it work in you to produce certain results? One of the results is that you become an overcomer. You become bold and you overcome obstacles. Look at verse 14. As soon as you receive, verse 14 follows. For you brothers became imitators, imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered, you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. So they suffered. They went through persecution and they withstood. That's a sign that someone received and it its work and it's he is able to stand firm. Lastly, a surprise to me. Did you catch in verse 13? He says, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received. So they received, but they thank God. I thought, well, if. They received, you should thank them. Says, guys, thank you so much that you received our teaching. We're so grateful that you did this. They received, but he thanks God. The only explanation, valid explanation, is that this is the challenge of the gospel. When the invitation sounds, it sounds like this. Would you receive? And the person says, I want to receive. And we say, God brought him in. God worked on his heart. God opened his eyes. He made it possible. Thank God. So if that's the process is happening with you, that you feel, you sense, you understand that you need to receive, God is at work. Would you come after church, pray with pastors? We would love to do that. Do it midweek. You don't have to do it in church. It doesn't change the effect of it, but receive the word of God. Lastly, as we pray, I want to give something for you to talk about uh, when you have lunch today, when you come home and gather your families probably and at your lunch table or dinner table, talk about this two things. First, fathers, share what is the most challenging aspect of today's teaching for you specifically. Out of all the spiritual fatherhood that we mentioned, the influence of fathers on their children. What is the most challenging for you? Share it. Become vulnerable a little bit in front of your children. 
just share, hey, guys, I struggle with this out of all the things. I mean, this is hard, this is hard, but this is really hard. Start, have a conversation about that. Number two, why don't you around the table just go and share who and how in the past influenced you spiritually? Who acted in your life as a spiritual father? Influenced you somehow? Share that, talk. That will be a great time, I think. And most importantly, of course, praise God for those people. Would you join me as we pray? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful and thankful that today we talked about fatherhood. We want to begin with you adopting us in your family. Even if family fails, even if church fails, you never fail. Father, today, based on this passage, we want to pray for our church that here in the fellowship of believers, children, young people, all kinds of people receive real spiritual fatherhood and care. Father, we pray for fathers at home. May they exercise this spiritual fatherhood. May they influence children with the objective truth, with their own lives, with their transformed characters. In the midst of challenges and hardships, when things are not clicking, when they mess around, and maybe even in their own life, but in the midst of it, they stick through and fulfill their role. Father, I pray that you would give them much grace. Much grace. We pray this in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.